Well, thank you guys so much for coming to this event. Um, I'm so proud to introduce Ella Marie Wiseman, whose newest novel, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook, we just found out is uh, spending yet another week on the New York Times <clears throat> bestseller list. Um, Ellen. So Ellen is known for writing historical novels that explore often little known episodes of historical injustice. Um, her previous books include The Orphan Collector, What She Left Behind, The Plum Tree, Coal River, and The Life She Was Given. She was born and raised and still lives in Three Mile Bay, which is a tiny hamlet in Northern New York on the Canadian border. She's a first generation um, German American who discovered her love of reading and writing while attending first grade in one of the last one room schoolhouses <laughs> um, in New York State. And since then her acclaimed novels have gone on to sell a uh, million copies in the United States alone and translated it to 20 languages. And her newest book, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook is set at the notorious Willowbrook State School in 1972. And joining her to speak about where the fact meets the fiction is Dr. William Bronston, a disability justice activist, physician, acclaimed author of Public Hostage, Public Ransom, which I highly recommend his nonfiction book. Um, and co-author of A History and Sociology at Willowbrook State School. He was staff physician at Willowbrook in the early 1970s, where he organized the parents and the workers against the institution's cruelty and dysfunction. He went on to lead the exposure and coordinate the federal class action lawsuit that ultimately uh, resulted in the consent decree that closed the institution at last. Uh, this achievement also set the stage for a national deinstitutionalization movement and the establishment of systems-based care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Dr. Bronson's bio goes on for pages, <laughs> which I, I will not subject him to this time, but um, it, we're just so lucky to have him here. And with that, we'll turn it over to you. Too. Yes, thank you, Rita. So um, I guess I'm gonna go first and um, I'm here to talk about my novel, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook, which is a, kind of a mix of fact and fiction and urban legend. And you know, when I was writing this book and I put Dr. Bronston's name in there and Geraldo Rivera and Dr. Wilkins who gave Geraldo Rivera the key, Never in a million years did I ever believe that this man would be sitting next to me. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's not intimidating at all that I was writing about it in my head and he lived it. So I'm going to try to do the best that I can. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the Hudson Park Library for having us. Um, as Vita said, I have to do a little bragging first uh, that it was, it's on the third week on the New York Times bestseller list. And it's a Barnes and Noble September pick, a Costco September pick, an Indie Next September pick. It's been on the Publishers Weekly uh, list, bestseller list, USA Today. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> so The Lost Girls of Willowbrook is set at uh, the Willowbrook State School on Staten Island. Um, in the 1970s. And I was first drawn to Willowbrook when I watched the documentary about an urban legend called Cropsy. And um, that's an urban legend about a supposed serial, serial killer who lived in the tunnels below the institution. And then I realized this is the state school that Geraldo Rivera did the expose on. So I was like, why do I not know more about this? And so as I began researching and, you know, I learned how dark and complex life inside the, the institution was. Um, and the more my sympathy for those who worked there and lived there uh, grew. So um, Willowbrook was far from school. It was pretty much a warehouse for the mentally and physically disabled. Um, parents put their kids there because they didn't know how to, take care of these kids or they didn't have the resources or they were encouraged by doctors to, you know, put them away for the sake of the family. 
you know, not knowing that, you know, they were pretty much condemning them to a horrible life. They thought they were doing the right thing. Um, but the parents were not in, allowed inside the boards. They were not allowed to see the living conditions. And these kids were brought out. If the parents showed up, the kids were brought out into the waiting room or I'm not sure if it was the waiting room, but he'll tell you. <laughs> um, to see them and, you know, they would say, oh, why does, why does little Johnny have a gash on his ear? Or what, what happened to the sneakers that I bought him? And, you know, it was always just, you know, we don't know, you know, they, they're probably in his room or whatever. So they didn't really know what was, the parents didn't really know for a long time what was going on. Um, but Willowbrook was grossly understaffed and underfunded and overrun. Um, and it was overrun with disease and violence and crime and uh, drug use and, um, there was also non-disabled children who were sent there. Um, sometimes, you know, foster care symptoms, systems didn't know what to do with these kids or some, I read accounts of like these wealthy parents that would pay to have their child's IQ lowered so they would be admitted because they just didn't want to deal with this troublesome kid. Um, and there was also instances of kids being found in public places with signs around their neck that said, take me to Willowbrook. So, um, you know, this was a 375 acre campus, 380. And, um, you know, it was, it was pretty much closed off from public site. It, so it kind of was its own underground city, developed its own, you know, society and hierarchy. And that just kind of added to the corrupt situation there. You know, the, the staff didn't trust the nurses because they, uh, report to administration and, you know, the staff, a lot of the staff didn't have background checks, so the nurses didn't trust them. Um, and the staff was afraid to tell on each other because, you know, if you ratted and you saw somebody do something wrong, then you'd have to worry about getting beat up in the parking lot um, or your tires slashed or, um, and, you know, it just became such an underground city that these employees could buy jewelry and drugs and meat and things. And I just learned listening to Dr. Bronston yesterday that um, the sheets and the soap and everything that was for the patients would be taken by the staff. And he can explain that way better than I can. So um, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook is about a 16 year old girl uh, who she, she believes that her twin sister has died of pneumonia because that's what her parents told her. And then she, overhears her stepfather say that her twin sister is actually missing from Willowbrook. So her twin sister's alive um, and she's missing from Willowbrook. So, you know, that's just has to be such a shock to find out that, you know, your sister is alive after believing that she was dead for 10 years uh, or six years. Um, and she knows nothing about Willowbrook other than the rumors surrounding it. Um, she knows that parents told kids, you know, you better behave or you will send you to Willowbrook or, you know, teenagers were told if they, you know, teenage girls, if you get pregnant, you'll, at this young age, you know, you'll have this deformed baby and it'll have to be sent to Willowbrook. Um, she learned, she, she heard about that they were doing medical experiments on the kids there. And that actually turned out to be true because they were trying to develop uh, vaccines for hepatitis and measles and other um, diseases. And it was all funded by the defense department. And, you know, the parents were kind of, I read a letter uh, during my research from the doctors to the parents to tell them why they should sign up their kids for this medical experiment. Some of it was to say, so that if you sign up your kid, they can bypass this long waiting list. But some of it was also, oh, they'll have better care. They'll have, they, you know, they'll have curtains on the windows and they'll have a toy to play with or, you know, and plus they said, you know, there's all this disease and these vaccines will protect them, when, which actually they had no idea whether they would protect them or not. They were just, you know, using them as, as guinea pigs. So um, Sage goes to Willowbrook to look for her twin. And when she arrives, the doctors think that she's the missing twin um, and they lock her up. Uh, someone asked me, I think it was Sarah Gelman on the Amazon, um, interview that I did. Do you think they wanted her to be the twin because they were going to get in trouble for having this girl missing for three days and not 
you know, reporting it or looking for her or finding her? Or do you think they really thought that she was the twin? And I think it was a combination of both. I think that, you know, they thought she was the twin because they were identical. But um, I also think that they were like, you know, they were not people to them. They were just numbers on a chart and, you know, they were getting money for these people. So it's like, okay, we've got this one back and so we can get the money and, you know, but people did, kids did disappear from Willowbrook, right? You bet. Yes. Um, and grownups. And grownups. <laughs> so, um, you know, Sage gets locked up and she learns firsthand, you know, how the reality of Willowbrook is a lot worse than she imagined. Um, so I chose, I chose this uh, route of putting her in there because I wanted to tell what it was like from the inside. I didn't want to write a story about someone from the outside trying to help. I wanted to write a firsthand experience because I thought it was a lot more intimate and you could feel the fear and the you know, absolute desperation for her to try to tr prove who she is and to try to prove find out what happened to her sister. So, um, you know, one thing I have to say is not all doctors and nurses were bad people as obvious right here. This, a, this is a, this man's a hero for trying to, to change the situation. Um, there was reports of employees buying, using their own money to buy soap and sheets and clothes and stuff for for the patients. Um, and Dr. Bronson was punished just for asking for painkillers or sheets or soap for uh, the residents. I shouldn't call them patients, should I? Residents. Residents, yes. Hostages. Like Hostages so. <laughs> um, and Dr. Bronson, obviously, what, like Rita said, he went on to help close this place down and to get organized appearance and really make a change. But it still took 15 years after Geraldo Rivera's expose for this place to close down. Um, but the Lost Girls of Willow Sh Will Brook is, um, it's not just a story about institutional abuse. It's also a story about a young woman, courageous young woman who, um, you know, she loves her sister so much that she's, she goes to this place. And in the end, you know, she gets trapped in a nightmare, but she finds a way of turning her heartache into something good, just like, Dr. Bronson here is 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 doing um, so. You know, even though Willowbrook was eventually shut down, the fight for disability rights and all that is is really still on, ongoing. And you know, it's just a reminder that we need to be more protective of the most vulnerable among us. And you know, every human being has a right to learn and grow and and be treated with kindness and and compassion. Um, and Dr. Bronson called Willowbrook a concentration camp. And I think that that's, a, you know, American concentration camp. And I think that's really important to look at it that way because we have so many books and so many novels about the Holocaust and people say, oh, we have to read this and we have to keep this alive and we have to make sure that we don't forget so it doesn't happen again. And that's what we need to do with Willowbrook, although it's kind of still happening, um, not to that large extent, you know, but people are still being uh, mistreated and institutionalized. And so this man has a plan and I'm completely honored to have him beside me. And um, I'm gonna be quiet now because he's amazing and I want him to talk. So uh, thanks for les listening to me. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so her book is uh, Showstopper. You got to read it. You got to oh, read it first. I need to say that too. I did his book that, that he co-authored was my number one resource for this book, and I learned so much. Um, and this one that he was writing at the same time I was writing mine is amazing. Sorry. Go yes. ahead. <laughs> um, Ellen's book has touched something really profound in our society. I mean, she sold tens of thousands of books in the first week. People walk into Barnes and Noble where the book stand is and they're just riveted. And it's really interesting. We must be as a society experiencing tremendous apprehension and fear right now. And somehow Willowbrook is a paradigmatic model 
of the loss of identity, the loss of safety, the loss of security. And uh, her book is being really grabbed by us, by the society for some reason. A lot of people know about Willowbrook and they're curious about that, but I think there's something deeper and much more uh, ominous that's going on right now. And so the, the reading of her book isn't gonna solve that problem, but people need some kind of relief from the apprehension that they're experiencing now with what's going on out here in our society and the election coming up November 8th and so forth. Um, I didn't know that she was writing this book and, and I got a call from Vita saying, you know, would I come and, and be with Ellen when she's doing her talking? And I was just tremendously honored and they were hugely apologetic because they thought that what I did was so different than what Ellen did in terms of fiction that I would be somehow critical or rejecting of the association, but quite the contrary. I think it's terribly important for people to become aware of what's going on in our society because we need profound cultural change now in America in terms of how we look at each other, care about each other, relate to each other. And the Willowbrook story is a harbinger story. It's like cancer in its most malignant form. The, the issue that I'm concerned with is that the Willowbrook story is a, a hammer to look at what's happening today with our nursing home system. Willowbrook was just a large tumor, but we have a metastasis practically in every community of congregate, segregated, dehumanizing, stereotyped, stigmatizing services for us as we age. So the fact of the matter about Willowbrook is that they are us, we are them. And to the extent that our novels essentially bring that home so that people become aware that they have to somehow play a role in transforming America. We need universal, comprehensive, single payer healthcare with no cost for people at the point of service. The vendors would negotiate rates and essentially we would have a high quality expanded Medicare system for all, improved Medicare and expanded Medicare for everybody in our country. But that requires a caring society, a caring community. And the question of how we begin to build bridges between each other and begin to develop networks with each other so that trust, community, uh, respect, inspiration, creativity, friendship can become the norm. That's not what's going on out here. That's not what's happening in our society. I don't know what's going to change it, but our stories essentially are aimed at raising that consciousness. And specifically, what I've built into Public Hostage, Public Ransom is the answer to the story. What I'd like to do is, is maybe read you a, a, a introduction to one of the, there's four photo chapters in my book. And um, the last one is called Injuries. And it was sort of like my surrender uh, at the institution after working there for three years. Uh, and so it really is the contextual framework, I think that, uh, that Ellen's book then kind of develops. So let, let me read this to you. It's just a page and a half. Here we go. Each of these photo chapters has uh, between 10 and 15 uh, pieces, uh, photographs, that were taken by me and other key photographers. And they're grouped in a way not to demonstrate grotesquerie or spectacle, but to show people the magnitude of violence of a violent environment. The folks that were trapped that became public hostages in Willowbrook were there to earn money for the state. They were all monetized. Otherwise it wouldn't be that way. Somebody had to be getting some benefit and money and power from the institutionalization, the incarceration. And the payment for the folks was Medicaid dollars 
three to four hundred dollars a day per day for everybody there. People were put into this particular place to die. Most of us, when we put somebody in a congregate segregated place, put them in there knowing sooner or later that they will probably die there because we don't have the capacity to handle that transition in normal society. After three years inside the bleak, hopeless buildings of Willowbrook, nothing made me sicker than the jolt of having to face a new injury. Something in me changed over the time I spent there, my tolerance for facing the ceaseless flow of gashes, burns, fractures, and massive bruises eroded and finally gave way. This occurred in direct relation to my growing understanding of why these injuries were happening. And as I was pitched deeper into the bowels of the warehouse, from infant services to teenage to adults, and then the magnitude of violence multiplied tenfold. I remember vividly preparing myself in medical school for the horrible things that a health worker must see and correct. I persuaded myself over time and by gentle conditioning that there was nothing too mutilated or offensive to approach rationally seeing a complex disruption of parts, blood vessels, nerves, skin, organs, tendons, each with a precise name and place. What is working, what is destroyed, where does this or that part belong? Reassemble, connect and mold the injured back together. What I did not or could not prepare for what drove me to wild rage and disgust and even panic was being helpless to stem the tide of injuries when the source was so tangible, so preventable, so inevitable, so clear, more than anything that tripped my fury and frustration was the incredible attitude of the institution and all its workers towards injuries. Nothing more exemplified this attitude than the wry mechanical tone of voice of the supervising nurse over the telephone when I was on night duty. Dr. Bronston, there's a laceration in building 22, one in building eight, a burn in building 20, and two temps, people with fever, in building 12. That was all a synopsis of four or five hours of the consequences of life for the hostages, just as simple, cool, and matter of fact as saying there's a cloud in the sky, the time is six o'clock, I spilled a glass of water, the phone is ringing. Never, never could I understand that attitude. Just telling me that somewhere among the stone structures lying somewhere on a steel bed, there in a treatment room, tied in a sheet was a person torn, violated, washed in agony, an innocent somewhere there within those 340 acres of grass, trees, stately brick buildings, a laceration in 27, that was all, no urgency, no anguish. God, what working there has done to my coworkers. I so clearly understood why the injuries occurred. When you crowd life together and turn up the flame of boredom, confinement, hopelessness, deprivation, disdain, cruelty, there will be injuries and injuries and injuries. It can only be one way, bites, tears, rents, avulsions, cuts, flesh, so fragile, so scarred, so ready to yield to a blow from a hand, a shoe, a chair, a key, a stone wall, a stone floor, no contest. These things I understood to end them would require the demolition of the system of warehousing and dehumanization. It was the detachment, the collaboration, the expectation and acceptance of this carnage by my workers and the staff of the institution that shattered me. Maybe they were too innocent themselves. Maybe they thought the injuries were a given, a river with an origin beyond eyesight, with a delta unimaginable. Maybe the confinement to one building where eight or 10 injuries a day occurred seemed tolerable. I, on the other hand, had to see it all in five or 10 buildings, scores, hundreds, thousands of crimes of negligence, dehumanization, institutionalization. There's no defense against such an onslaught unless one is packed away or amputated one's humanity and sanity. Towards the end, after the lawsuits, after the TV exposés, after the memos, the meetings, it became too much. The announcement of an injury to me over and over, and there was no defense, it was all over. I was a volcano, I cried, I cursed over the phone, I 
cursed in the buildings. I began to fantasize how to confront the director and the commissioner and do to them what they were doing to the thousands of their victims, their hostages, for whom they received thousands of dollars each year. Only the destruction of the jailers, only the raising of their murderous, violent institutions could stop the river of suffering, blood and ravaged souls. I could not go on any longer on the inside. I somehow got a two year paid educational leave to go away to Syracuse University. I was through. I fled to friends in Canada, then California, like an exhausted, deeply depressed and half drowned man pulled from the floodwaters. I sought comfort, normalcy, humanity. There are limits to what each of us can continuously endure regardless of support and understanding. As you look at these next agonizing photos, the evidence, understand that the flooding river of injuries still flows in the institution nation, segregated, congregated everywhere. So then, you know, there's a, a set of photographs just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, the picture on the right is the back of a girl who was beaten with keys by a worker or, a, or a, another resident. Um, and and there's, there's four photo chapters like this, and each one is introduced by a couple of pages of introduction like that. Um, so when I got there, I, I came out of an um, incredibly elegant training program at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. I, I was in a hospital that was one of the great children's hospitals in the United States, and there were 180 beds, and there were 400 of the most extraordinary specialist physicians uh, in the country serving those 180 people, kids, children. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little leaky from time to time. And uh, when I got to Willowbrook, I was assigned to what was called a baby building. There were five of them in this particular cluster. It had 200 beds, 200 broken children at the level that you can't even imagine the, the, the degree of neglect and damage of these kids, kids with cerebral palsy and mental retardation and congenital disabilities. And the charts were, you know, each chart was this thick and there were six or eight of them. The, 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 the one that was happening now was still in the building, the others were in storage. And when I went into these charts to find out what was going on with this particular kid, there was no information whatsoever to help me understand. There was no off-service notes. There was no orientation by the doctor that preceded me in terms of, of dealing with the children. And I, I just knew that it was gonna take me God knows how long to find out what was wrong with my children. I mean, I had 200 kids. I had two to three workers on a ward that essentially weren't doing any treatment program. They were just monitoring. The kids were in large part drugged to be as insensible and immobile as possible because there weren't enough workers to handle the need. I had one to two nurses for the whole building, a charge aid for the building. And I had these four wards uh, in each of the four corners of this big brick building, this two story brick building. All the young people spent the whole day on the floor in, a, in the day room, the day room. They essentially were taken in and, and fed in a, uh, a cafeteria area, not cafeteria, they were served, they were put on tables and ate with their hands because there were no utensils. And they were, they were fed slop, I mean, soft food that resulted in diarrhea and every kind of intestinal problem. And then there was the bed area where all the cribs were next to each other, one right next to each other, from front of the room to the back of the room, from side to side. They never, ever, were taken outside because there weren't enough workers to take a group of people outside and only leave one worker back on the ward with the remainder of the people. And um, there, I mean, when I first got there, I mean, there were injuries and illnesses that were just staggering. I mean, every kid was just absolutely infected with staphylococcus, with intestinal parasites. I mean, anything you can imagine. And then of course they had their own vulnerabilities uh, easily getting pneumonia, uh, all, all sorts of problems that were going on because the doctors in the institution uh, were simply there to legitimize the medical legitimacy 
of the condition of the, of the, of the system. The commissioner for the Department of Mental Hygiene was an MD psychiatrist. So the model of understanding the people in the institution was a medical model, which meant that mental retardation was an incurable progressive condition that essentially you know, was, was, not, was not treatable by anything. Doctors don't understand child development. They don't understand, we're not trained in child development. The whole place should have been run by the State Department of Education, but it was run by the State Department of Mental Hygiene. So the doctors who were hired there were there to legitimize the definition of what the problem was, which wasn't what the problem was. And of course, these were guys, men and women, that some didn't speak English, some you know, couldn't get a job out in the open society as, as caregivers. And they didn't touch the people that were there. They came in sport coats and, and regular clothing and they would have a worker bring uh, an individual and hold up uh, you know, the, the injured part or the sick part or whatever it was. They would make some sort of a note and then that would be the end of that. And they could potentially ask for a consultant to look at some specific area, but the consultants, so that would, that would result in the kid being taken next week or whatever it was to a specialist in the medical building on the other side of the property and brought back with some recommendations. But even the consultants were just out of it. For example, the dermatologist, I was explaining to Ellen the other day, everybody had this terrible psoriatic eczematous-like skin problem. And, and the dermatologists were treating it with steroid creams because they defined it as mongoloid dermatitis. So it was in the intertrigo areas between the fingers, under the armpits, in the hair. And the minute I saw it, I knew what it was. It had nothing to do, I mean, treating it with steroids was absolutely the wrong problem because this was scabies, institution-wide scabies. And all you had to do was put these kids into a shower with scabetic soap, cleaned up, fixed. Within a week, all of that disease that had been treated for years with steroids leading to scabbing, crusting, eczematous, you know, lesions was gone because these were bugs that were in the skin. And you know, by the by the distribution of the lesions, exactly what it was. And the specialist missed the diagnosis. And then people were having terrible problems with their circulatory system in their legs. And part of the reason for that was that everybody walked barefoot. They walked barefoot on a floor that was as filthy as anything on earth. Uh, the floors essentially were cleaned with a concentrate called Vestal, which should have been cut one to 10. But when the gallons came to the building, the stuff was used concentrated on the floor. And generally speaking, the people mopping the floor were not the paid staff. They were capable residents that were doing the work that were in, imposed into service. And so the floors were never really clean. The problem was when anybody would lay down on the floor, a couple of things would happen. Number one, uh, they would get a burn from the concentrated Vestal. Then they would drag themselves over because they were drugged to the radiator, which was the only warm place in the, in the room and fall asleep and maybe get further burns. But the real problem was that as they walked on this stuff, they developed cracking of the skin of their feet and toes. So little by little, infection began to come in and they began to develop a, a variety of different kinds of dermatitis that became superficial vein, then deep vein disease, ultimately resulting in the collapse of their circulatory system in their lower extremities so that people were on the verge of needing amputations at the age of 18, 19, 20, had they been there since they were seven, eight or nine, which were conditions that, you know, really, you know, would only show up in people in their seventies or eighties in the normal course of things, not walking on, you know, shit every day. So the, the circumstances in the place, it was very hard for me to see what was going on because I was so overwhelmed with just trying to get to know the people that I was responsible for because at some level, uh, I knew that they were me. And uh, 
I had to know who they were. And I cared about who they were profoundly. I mean, I was the doctor to take care of them. And that's why I became a doctor was to provide care. Um, little by little, you know, I began talking with these families that they would come to visit. Not everybody would come to visit because most families were driven away or abandoned their kids. And they did that because they were, they were required by social mores and by the medical profession to just let the kid go. The kid would be disappeared. And, and the result of that was profound because so let's say maybe 18 or 20 percent of the people came to visit but when they came they had to wait outside the building on the property and the workers would bring an individual out and essentially turn them loose to the family to take or not take thank you um, so the first thing I, I, I began meeting with all these families to find out why their kid was there, how they were, because I knew why the kid was there. The kid was not there because they chose to put the kid there. The kid was there was because they didn't have a choice. And the state of New York did not have a single group home, a single individual placement, not a one. The state of New York used their economic clout in order to build a bonding system to essentially service the big banks owned by the governor and his brother. And all of the construction of the institutions were based on non-tax, on tax exempt bonds bought by ordinary people to essentially repay the mortgages for the construction of these buildings, which had to be paid for building by building, institution by institution by the people in there. And the money came from Medicaid, from the federal government three to $400 per person per day. So people were put in there with the clear political understanding that they were there to earn money as long as they were alive and to keep them alive at the lowest possible level as long as possible. So it was a trade-off between longevity and, and, and cheapness. That's why no closing, that's why no soap, that's why, you know, and then of course, there's the contractors, you know, multi-zillion dollars worth of, of drugs, multi-zillion dollars worth of sheets, multi-zillion dollars worth of, 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 of laundry and, and transportation and all. And the administrators had their black Cadillacs on the other side of the property or lived in the back in these large mansions. But they never came into where the people were. So um, we... Um, <laughs> I began to organize the families and I began to train my workers. I began to have training sessions for the people in my building. Um, and I was moved from building to building because I would go to the administrator and I'd say, you know, we need plastic surgery uh, 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 suture material. I can't use upholstery material to sew up somebody's face. I need, you know, small needles. I need you know, fine, fine thread. I need lidocaine because we've got to you know, anesthetize when we, when we sew up somebody because the doctors wouldn't use any anesthesia, they would just sew. I mean, the, the inhumanity, the cruelty was simply staggering, staggering cruelty, staggering alienation of the people in charge. And I tried to organize the doctors at one point with Mike who had come in uh, and I, I, I was asked to be the president of the doctors association. I put a program on the ground for them, which is described in the book. And uh, they called me a communist which was true, but they didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't know that. And, uh, and so I, I pulled out from the doctor's organization. I couldn't organize the workers, which is why I went in there in the first place, because I was the physician for the Black Panther Party in the state of New York for a long period of time, 40 of my colleagues that were coming in from all over the country. Uh, my brother in the back, Dr. Mick McGarvey, was one of the co-organizers of our organization. And so 40, 40, of us came into New York at the same time. I had just finished, I'd been fired from my residency at Menegers for organizing a union and seizing control of all the hospitals in Eastern Kansas in order to get the state to recognize the union rather than striking. So I, mean, so I had a lot of experience in understanding evil and understanding 
the, the, the role of the bureaucracy in maintaining the status quo in places where ordinary people were just ground and dirt, whether it was the mental hospital, Topeka State Hospital, or Willowbrook. And, and my, my interest was to build some kind of a mass base of concern. And so the parents became the only real body of people that we could draw together in order to speak at something that, that was in their hearts. They were, they, they were so despairing, so isolated, so removed from any kind of understanding of the situation, you know, and, and scared to death to raise a fuss because they didn't want retaliation. You know, when Ellen says they would bring the kid there that had a cut or something like that, it was more than a cut. People were destroyed. I mean, people were ground to dirt, you know, and the, I show the pictures in the book very specifically to show you the degree of, of destruction. There was nothing soft in the room. The chairs were, were formica and, and metal. The, 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 the tables were so heavy you couldn't lift them. The, the benches were these gigantic old wooden benches, you know, like, like, like church pews on steroids that were around the room that you couldn't even lift. So when, when the people in the, in, the, in the place having nothing to do all day, having no place to go all day, all day, every day, every week, every month, every year, were nuts. I mean, they were made crazy, you know, by the gravest uh, deprivation, psychological deprivation. I mean, they couldn't, they could touch each other, but, but you know, if they touched a worker, they would get put into a straitjacket or hit with Thorazine. And anytime there was a problem, the, the workers would call me to order a Thorazine. I am Thorazine shot to take somebody down or to sign every day for a camisole. So the charts were filled with the orders of all the meds that people were taking and all the straitjacket opportunities and all the injury descriptions and the, and the clinical information about the people was limited to maybe one or two paragraphs all together, which was fraudulent, essentially administered by this very elegant psychologist and his couple, three assistants at the institutional level to qualify people for institutionalization. So at the point where things, and things got worse, so the other piece of the puzzle was that, that Rockefeller wanted to build his palace in Albany, the white marble and gold thing that he created. And so he cut the budget by a billion dollars and that was our budget. And so we lost a third of our workers within about three or four months as a result of the budget cut. And I mean, the place already was run so fragilely and organically by people solving problems and figuring out how to work with the inadequacies. But when they cut that many people, and didn't hire to fill the positions, the whole organicity of care evaporated. And you can't just put more people in and fix things. People have worked out strategies of how to connect with one another to do things that are almost impossible that they figured out. And everybody was solving the problem vertically in their own little space, in their own ward, whatever. So this book essentially describes how I got into a gunfight with the administration. I was able to get a pro bono lawyer, a labor lawyer, who was the best labor lawyer in New York at the time. His name was Gene Eisner. And we filed a grievance. Every time they would attack me, we'd file a grievance. And every time I went to go see somebody, I would in detail document exactly what it was that I was seeing and why it was happening. Not that somebody had a cut, but that there was no workers on the ward and that this chair came and, and whatever, or that this rape happened or this pregnancy shouldn't have happened or this cancer was undiagnosed or that the doctor didn't come and he was supposed to be called. And it was this constant war and just got more and more intense every day. And so every time they would do something really dehumanizing or untoward, I would document it. And, I, and so my book has examples of memos, exchanges between me and the monsters. And little by little, uh, we began 
to, and then, then the parents rose up finally and began to confront the administrator who was just a big fat blowhard. And, and, uh, and he was just terrified and he fired my coworker and his, his, his uh, assistant his social worker. And Michael called up our lawyer whose name was Jerry Rivera. Our lawyer was working with us in another campaign at the US Public Health Hospital here in the island at the time. And uh, he had just essentially been hired by Fox and changed his name to Geraldo Rivera. And uh, he came with his cameras and he was so overwhelmingly shocked by what he saw that, you know, and, and he was not, you know, uh, he was not who he is now. He was a young, beautiful man, very sensitive, very caring, very, uh, you know, uh, charismatic. And he just laid out for the state of New York in his, in his expose filming his rage and his disgust and, 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 and his frustration at the situation. And, and you know, the, the people watching the program were off the charts. It became national news. Willowbrook became the symbol of an American concentration camp, which it was. And so at that point, people poured in, all the bureaucrats poured in. I mean, everybody poured in, including the FBI because they needed to vilify Mike and I to get us out of there because you know we were essentially holding the key to all this. And, and, and so little by little, we were able to build a, a base of the major academics in the state, the major lawyers in the state, and the major parent organizations in the state, the defense organizations like the Association for Retarded Citizens, United Cerebral Palsy, Autism, Epilepsy, on and on and on. All the people that were in the, in the house at that time. And, and, and we built a strategy to close the place down, not fix it. They wanted to fix it, of course. They wanted to keep the paradigm going. And we knew that we had to get people the hell out of there. And, and the problem was that change, even ideal change is so immensely difficult to accomplish because you know, you're starting with people that God knows what they know the workers were still state workers that brought their practices out into the community when they became assigned to community-based services. We had to hire a whole new army of caregivers. And uh, the important part was that the story of how the federal trial happened is immensely moving. We beat them, we broke them. And they should have been put in jail for crimes against humanity, unfortunately, the way the system works, these people were all given major jobs in, in universities, you know, like this guy Grunberg, who was a Nazi, who was the commissioner of mental retardation, just this terrible man. Uh, Hammond kind of went off and had a heart attack and died. Uh, and some of the other people just disappeared. Alan Miller disappeared, somehow or another, the commissioner. But what came out of it was a total reorganization of the delivery system here in New York as a halfway measure under the hammer of the federal court. My colleague Ronnie Cohen here is a monitor in a number of states for federal class actions for deinstitutionalization, de which is still going on. But the point of all this is that Willowbrook was just an old cancer. The metastasis is with us right now. And we are headed for institutionalization as we age because there is no alternative. And what we need is the same thing that our constituency counts on in their entitlement, individualized plan services to deflect us from segregated congregate terminus. If we had a workforce in the community, in the home and families coming together and adequate funding for individualized solutions for each one of us, we would not have to necessarily go into institutions. Now, how to imagine that in ideal form and how to get there is going to be a pain in the ass. It's going to be a real, real tough hold. But we have to do it because if we don't, you know, smaller and worse, we'll die earlier. We'll die with, without our identity. We'll die without our property. We'll be bled to death to be eligible for Medicaid. Medicaid must be ended. It is absolutely evil. There is no virtue in Medicaid. And of course, 
uh, when we get rid of Medicaid, we have to transform Medicare and we have to have the right to healthcare as a good, not a commodity. Uh, because we have all the money in the world to solve this problem, twice as much as any other country on the planet. And yet there are close to 41 people, 41 million people in America that either can't get or can't afford healthcare. Medi not healthcare, healthcare is not for sale, only medical care is for sale. So, so first of all, get this woman's book and read it. I mean, I mean you'll, you'll get off on the beauty, her imagination is spectacular. I had to put the book down after four chapters, it made me too anxious. It's so intense and so tangible. And I never experienced what it was like to be at the end of a Thorazine needle. I was at the plunger end of the Thorazine needle. Her kid was at the end of the needle that essentially knocked her out and tied her to a bed, you know, and essentially threatened her day in and day out. I mean, the implacable inhumanity, the cruelty of the staff, the complicity, the mindless complicity of my coworkers was just breathtaking. Then get my book <laughs> and, and, and watch the story because I opened from the start with a clear vision of what we need and what the problem is. I try and explain and interpret what we're living through right now. And, and I think that this is a, a paradigm, a metaphor, a harbinger of what has to happen in our society to humanize us. So I don't know, I'm, I'm, I've been blabbing on you, I'm sorry. I'd like to read you more pieces of it, but she's got her book too to read. And so we'd like to get feedback. How about some more. questions, does anybody have questions? Or comments and stories, yeah. you know. Take your time. I mean, how many people have elders that are uh, in need of help that you can't provide them? Hmm. Anybody in, in some kind of nursing home situation yeah. right now? No? It's expensive, isn't it? Shouldn't be, shouldn't cost anything. Shouldn't cost us anything. The money's there. Yes, sir. Yeah, tell me. Why, why do you think Whoa, book like this so long. Oh, and are, how close do you think people that have been watching us on Zoom? So there's some comments from outside. So let's start again. Are you hearing us? Hello. Yeah. Good. Talk. Um why do you think well a book can like like this so long and how close are we still like going back to there and what can we do as the able people to make sure that it don't happen again? I know that a lot, I'm sorry. So I only got a little bit of that, but I'll try and see if I can answer some of that. Uh, he wanted to know what, what we're going to do about the problem. I mean, essentially, I mean, we got a, we got a major problem. I think he asked about those workers, what happened to those evil people. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Danny, sorry, Danny asked a two-part question. She asked number one, why was Willowbrook open for so long, and what can we do to make sure something like this doesn't happen again? <laughs> Danny, dear. Well, the reason Willowbrook was open so long was that nobody essentially confronted it or exposed it for what it was, and it it got progressively worse and worse and worse. You know, it started as a prisoner of war camp for Italian prisoners at one point, and then became something else, and then finally became a warehouse for people that were different. And the reason it was open for so long was because even now, we have a very cruel way of dealing with exceptional differentness, with people that are really different. And what will fix it essentially is changing the way in which we deal with people that have you know, negative labels, you know, that are, that are seen as less than human or, or different enough and don't fit in the school system, don't fit on the streets, don't fit in the subways, 
you know, don't, don't fit in the movie houses, don't fit in the restaurants for whatever reason. And, you know, we have to fix that. We have to, we have to, we have to have a way of you and your family joining in your organizations with art or United Cerebral Palsy or whatever, and speaking out about the need to have universal healthcare, because that'll fix a lot of stuff. Because every, it, you know, it'll fix a lot of stuff for a lot of people. That's what we, and Willowbrook is closed now, but there's still nursing homes all over the place. And you and yeah. I are we're headed for that same nursing home at some point as we get older. And that's not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm really thinking about moving out of my family house. But I'm also scared because I'm kind of in a grind still. So I don't know if they have my back at heart. And I don't want to be in like a group home or like roller book. I understand. I totally get it. You're right. You're right. That that's not acceptable. And so we're working on getting it down to one person, one space. You know, but you know, we're going to have to work together to try and get that to happen. The important thing is you got to keep saying that. You got to keep saying that that a group home is not acceptable to you and not acceptable to your friends and shouldn't be acceptable to your family, because we can make it right, and ideally right. Mom, did I get that right? Yes, Danny's an amazing self-advocate for themselves and for the disability community. Um, they're Terrific. totally fighting the fight for access for all right now. Terrific. Thank you so much. You know, we're really, we're really hoping that we win together on this, Mother. Thank you very much. <laughs> we better awesome thing. Evil people don't get a man. I mean, but I'm sorry. I heard that way I was. Thanks, kiddo. Thank you very much. Did you have something that you yes, please speak? Well, the, the group homes, once Willowbrook was closed, a lot of the patients and then subsequent patients. Hostages, yeah. Them. Residents, the right. Homes, Victims. Under the judicial order. Right. Now, were, they, were they largely unsuccessful? Were some more successful and some not? Was that a decent? You're right. Speak to it. You're right. That is some, that the, the, where people went was kind of um, a crapshoot because there were so many people that replaced. There were so many places that didn't have enough staff or any of those kinds of things. But there was once the once the um, all the legal stuff was put into place. People had to do it and had to make places. The problem is, in those days, we thought it was fine to put eight people in a house together because nobody knew any better and the kids were better than 50. What, 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 yeah, exactly. But now we know that people should live with one or two or three or four, whatever type of people they want with or by themselves, and they should still get the same kinds of services that they need. So we, it was it better than the book? A thousand percent, but was it good enough? Not really. And, and most, a lot of that has improved over the last, what, 30, 40 years that we've all been working on this. And, um, and so it is, it is better than it was before, but we still need, and, and it's, it's people's attitudes as well. It's not just, is the house too big or not? But right this minute, there's a, uh, such a shortage of people who want to work in these homes where people live that it, it is really scary. And it's not just in New York, it's I've I been in many states where they have exactly the same thing. It's a national issue. But it's it's a million times better than it was in Staten Island, but not good enough. So well, because, yeah, because, because there are too many people or just not good, good enough staff or well, not the right we, we we currently have right now. So when when Willowbrook was built, I think it was built originally for about fifteen hundred people. By the time we were getting into all of the struggle with everybody, there were six thousand people living in a place that was supposed to have a quarter of that. So so yes, so that was that was a, 
a huge problem, obviously. But still, in this day and age, we have um, a group that is called the Consumer Advisory Board, which for people who don't have families to help them and roast them. And they still have people on, I would say, 1,500, 1,800 people that, that still are not in the best situations that they should be in. Um, there are still people living in bigger places, smaller places, places they don't want. And I think we started somewhere at the beginning of this saying that individuals should be treated as individuals like we are. And that's something we're still not finished making up, in my opinion. If anybody else here works with some of these groups, I don't know. Yeah, on, on, on that note, um, I mean, the number one way that we can really provide care for people uh, we need to listen to disabled people because there are disabled activists and organizers who are telling us exactly the support and care they need. And the next step to that is we need to pay direct support professionals who are giving support. People need to be making livable wages in order for the field to continue to grow. Um, yeah, we need to listen to disabled people who are at the forefront of this work right now, disability justice activism demanding and explaining exactly what it is they need. Able-bodied people don't know what they need. So we need to actually listen to the folks who are Im impacted by these systems. You know, the, we're at a place now in our political history where there has to be union between the categorical population and the general population. We need to speak to the need for universal health care and people need to belong to organizations, categorical organizations, as well as general organizations that essentially are addressing the need for major system change. The most important thing that I think has to happen in the first round is that we have to have advocacy to set up meaningful curriculum and a major training program for direct service personnel, which does not exist adequately right now. We need to build an army of caregivers, not just for our community, but for the general community, because all of us are going to become exceptionally different and dependent in one way or another. And the, and the disability community has to be the vanguard for that agenda. They have to essentially lead the general community, the, the policymakers, in, 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 in driving home public policy that the solution is for all people in society, not just a certain crowd. Otherwise, we're in competition with other special interest groups, which only divide and conquer the working class in which we all belong. It's really important to understand that. We're no longer have the luxury of advocating just for our own people. We've got to understand that issues of climate and energy issues of housing. I mean, look at all the people out there unhoused in our community. Look at the squalor and, and, and the, 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 the poverty out there on the street. Our, our constituency is, is driven into poverty purposely by public policy made by white guys in the legislature. It's not an accident that all of our people are in large part poor. They're required to be poor to get even a sliver of medical care and are afraid to earn a drop of extra money without losing their Medicaid eligibility. That's ridiculous. I mean, when you stop to think about it, it's criminal. It's outrageous. But we have to have a, mobiliz a political mobilization of the public, which we have to bond with. We have to work with organized labor. We have to work with the black and brown community and the, the Native American community. We have to work with the LGBTQ crowd. We have to build commonality between their agendas and our agendas for universal enfranchisement, quality living, and understand what that's all about and build a new workforce. And we have to find the trainers and the curriculum to teach people how to be human beings in our society. Because that's the first problem that we're not teaching people how to really be quality human beings. Somehow or another people are growing up, you know, idiots. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's astounding to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Disability is the number one identity category or oppressed category that everyone can and will be a part of at some point in their life. Exactly so right. And we have to build that connection in people's minds. Um, what support is set up for survivors of Willowbrook today? I'm sorry. 
it's a way. Excuse me, one second. Yes. We were just wondering if you just pointed it that the Who are you? <laughs> wait, wait. Theo, I don't know. T tell us who you are. Tell us who you are. My name's Theo. Um, I am a uh, theater teacher at, at United Cerebral Palsy, now where we go by the name Adapt Community Network. I teach theater. I work with a lot of the folks who are here on Zoom right Terrific. now. Terrific. So your, your tools, your theater tools become enormous, enormous tools in order to change people's attitudes. And it's really wonderful. Do you know a guy named James Garcia, who's the national PR director for National Cerebral Palsy? Oh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with James Garcia. Okay, so he's the national UCP guy. <laughs> okay, amazing. <laughs> I'm going to give you a phone number right now, so get out a pencil quick. Okay, I've got one. I'm ready to go. 602-460-1374. Uh, can you tell me the last four again? 602-460-1374, James Garcia. He's in Phoenix, Arizona. Tell him that you talk with us, with me, and you need to work out. I need to some... send it? No, you need to work out some strategy to connect what you're doing with what he's doing because he can reach every chapter in the country overnight. He's wow, their PR so guy for all nationals, you know, UCP. Mm -hmm. so those of you that are involved in, uh, in mental retardation in IDD, there's a woman named Laura Kennedy, who is the incoming national president of ARC. And she's fantastic. Um, and her phone number is, uh, just a minute here, I'm gonna give it <laughs> Her phone number is 917-597-6782. Tell her you need to be, you need to be part of the campaign for change. New workforce, new values, and identification with the needs of the general population, climate, <laughs> housing, food, poverty. That's what we've got to attack now. There's no shortcut. There's no, there's no small area. It's all finally in one place and we need to build mm -hmm. unity amongst yeah. the activist movement. Yeah, it's all awesome. exactly. feedback here Thank from you. our room. Thank you very much, by the way. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So back, back to our room for a minute, please. Question or two statements. Go ahead. So has anything changed because now you have these companies that are paying relatives for taking care of relatives? Has that helped any? There's 41. Meaning that if you, this person now does not have to go to an institution. Kinship care. Yeah, kinship care. Certainly it's going to help well, because so normally those we people. Know, we know how effective it is. I, I can't tell you that yet. So the other thing is, we have people, myself, who belongs to AARP that has a huge membership. And how is AARP fighting in this that we're trying to not? You want to hear the hard AARP. truth? You, yeah, you, gotta, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta be willing to hear this now. Should I cancel my membership? Yeah, you know. AARP is an insurance company. I know that. And they have to end their insurance role and they have to subscribe to universal single payer healthcare. Otherwise, they're absolutely part of the problem. And they're essentially marketing Medicaid Advantage, mm -hmm. which is all privatization of a public system at, at, at the level of 30% more overhead than normal Medicare. Yeah, so people need to know more about that. I mean, I work for the city and, and part of the retirement plan is a Medicare Advantage. Right, and Medicare Advantage is bad. It, it's more privatization and it's, it's gonna get worse. And I don't wanna go into that. I mean, it's much more complicated, but I think the question of finding the right organizations to be part of right. and speaking out, I mean, you've got churches, you've got clubs, you've got book clubs, and you've got a lot of different social organizations that have to pay attention to and look at her book, look at my book, look at what's going on on the website. So I have a website that essentially lays out the model of an ideal healthcare, healthcare delivery system for America. It's called ourhealth.pub, P-U-B. Pub is short for public. It's a new like com or net or whatever. Ourhealth.pub, P-U-B, public. 
look at that model, look at it carefully. It may take you a little bit of time. It's a complicated modular you know, description of what a healthcare system ought to be like and why we need a specialized workforce for our constituency, why the education system needs a specialized workforce for students at the K-12 and post-secondary level, why people are suffering from addiction, people suffering from mental health, agricultural workers and, and rural denizens need specialized teams of health workers that are different because there are different needs for those different categories of people. You know, we need a customized strategy of providing care and comfort, and we need to end fear. Well, I, I just wanted to identify yourself. What's that? Identify yourself. I'm Gene Eisner. I was. Gene, shit, I didn't recognize it. <laughs> He's sitting right in front of me, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got so unable to the tell. So that means that's Laurel Eisner sitting next to Jesus. This is my lawyer. This is my defense. This guy gives me a call and says, uh, You've been highly recommended. Uh, and I have, I've been, I have an impossible task out in Willowbrook. I've never even heard of Willowbrook. So he invites me to come out and he says, first thing I want to do is I want to give you a tour of this wonderful institution. He gives me a tour. I almost threw up walking through and seeing these horrible conditions. And he starts to describe how the uh, administration uh, was, he was the only person I, or, or there was another doctor, Mike Wilkins. What was his name? Mike Wilkins. Yeah. But he came uh, later. He was the only other. He, he died. He, no, he came later. Oh. Uh, he was the only other guy that mm. willing to take them on. And I said, This is an impossible task, Bill. You'll never be able to fight them. It's like you can't fight City Hall. He says, You just wait and see. <laughs> and so. We began, <laughs> Dr. Hammond, as I recall, yep. uh, Fat Jack, we called him. <laughs> uh, he was disciplining Bill for every, everything he did or didn't do. And we started filing grievance after grievance after grievance. We started uh, appealing everything and we were a real thorn in, in Jack's, Fat Jack's side. And uh, we were surprised when the appeals went up to Albany and we didn't get any satisfaction because we were told that the commissioner uh, was a decent guy. What was his name? Alan Miller. What was his name? Alan Miller. Alan Miller, we were told that Commissioner Miller was a decent guy. So I said, well, why don't we take a drive up to Albany and meet with this guy, Miller? And so we did. And um, he rubber stamped everything that uh, Fat Jack was doing. Uh, and we said, we're not going to get any relief from, from Alan Miller. Uh, so then you filed. Gene didn't know that. I knew that we weren't going to get relief. Yeah. He kept saying, listen, don't worry, let's just file because, you know, ultimately we can go to court if the administrative system doesn't work. So we weren't getting very far, although we were annoying them uh, until uh, a television guy, this guy that was Jerry Ritters. And all of a sudden, when Jerry Ritters went in and with his TV cameras on Channel 7, he suddenly became Geraldo Rivera, <laughs> Jerry Ritters. Yeah. And he became a big star. Wow. And he opened the, the world to the horrors of Willowbrook. Still so and then 
we said, we're not getting anywhere here. We, we, gotta, we gotta broaden our horizon. And Bill kept saying to me, you know, they're, they're violating people's constitutional rights. And I said, well, you know, I, got, I must admit to you, uh, Bill, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm a labor lawyer. I don't do constitutional. So why don't we talk to the New York Civil Liberties Union? And, and, and they said, yeah, they were very interested. And then we had a meeting of about uh, 150, 200 people. You people taught the monastery? The monastery. Yeah, and, and we decided we're going to bring a class action. Uh, after that, I, I, my role really wasn't very much. So I helped ignite the whole thing. Uh, and then the constitution lawyers took over. And we were very lucky when you filed the action. I believe we drew Orrin Judd. Orrin right. Judd, right. That was a judge. That was a judge. Was a great, great one of the great judge. judges uh, uh, sitting in the federal court. You know, when you file an action in court, uh, you never know who you're going to get. You could get a Judge Clarence Thomas, <laughs> or you could get, uh, uh, you know, Judge, uh, uh, she should only. Uh, Rest in peace, uh, uh, RPG. Uh, you never know who you're going to get. But if we reach your judge, and uh, he not only uh, was very impressed with the whole case, but even after he rendered his decision, he decided to stay on and see this thing through yeah. and oversaw the, the breakup of, of, of Little Book. Yeah. But, uh, Bill, Bill uh, took it on with great odds, and we never thought it would uh, reach the point where uh, Bill almost single-handedly was responsible for tearing down Little Brook. But he said he was going to do it, and he was right. He did it, and I was very proud to have played a small part. A mm, small part of my life. life. So, there's, there's tons of Gene's briefs in here to just show how he, I mean, he turned the screw on these guys. I mean, without him, I would have been killed and over and over again. He's like a page turner. I mean, there's lots of briefs, but it's fascinating to me. It's not. I, I'd like Ellen to, to get back to Ellen for, I mean, you know, she's really the. The queen here that's got a <laughs> no, you're the hero. Well, you know, those things just happen. You know, that's an after the thought. All we were doing was just, I just want to tell you, all I was doing was being a good doctor. I mean, I'm not a hero. I'm just, I was just a committed good doctor and I wanted to take care of people and I, I adored the people I was serving and I spent time with them and I cleaned them up. I mean, I, I stopped doing straight jackets, I stopped doing Thorazine, I, I handled in end of all the infectious diseases, you can't imagine the jungle tropical diseases that were ep epidemic in this place. And it was horrendous. So once the thing was clean of medical problems, which was fixable, now we needed an educational system to fundamentally matriculate these folks back into the community as citizens, regardless of the magnitude of their difference. So this new college, by the way, really needs to have as its theme exceptional differentness, not disability. The notion of disability is really a misnomer. It's a bad word because it's a categorical term and it's, it, it, it promotes a stigmatic stereotype vision. All that we're talking about is differentness. And once you say that differentness is what separates us, then it's all of us, you know, together. And what we need are the kinds of things you know you're talking about in terms of family payment. The problem is that there's about 40 million or so unpaid people forced to take care of their dependent relatives. You know what that means? Pulling those people out from the economic system. 40 million people that can't contribute economically. 
other than managing, you know, a dependent person in a state of poverty and, and losing their lives, their families, their, I mean, the, the, the impact so of taking- I wonder about that. It's yes, like Laurel. I, I know only about how kinship care yeah. going in the foster care system. Yeah. And that, that, was, that was somewhat revolutionary and has made a very big difference. Yeah. Because children, instead of being pulled out of their parents- Family. Allegedly, uh, presumably abusive or negligent parental. Yes. Family, they're placed with relatives and relatives, you know, and the city began finally paying with Medicaid, yeah. a variety of Medicaid yeah, yeah, yeah. dollars and other kind of child care dollars. And that made a difference for, think, for, for many because at least they were, maybe it's not perfect, but at least they are not Absolutely. someone who is related. They right. have that, that's what people they're call they're incremental. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but it's a family member, and the family members get paid. Yeah. And the job in the kitchen, right? Foster care kitchen program, which is, you know, it's been it's been productive, but I don't know how it works. They have the same program for um, seniors, also caretaker programs. Yeah, that's right. Where they will take care of a senior person. What is the name of that program? Um, I don't know the name of it. It's several. It's several. Yeah. It's not a bad model if you think about it. Because, because you, you do have, have, and then you do have some relatives who say you are relative and you do not go, and you already taken care of your mother. Right. But now you can get paid to take care of your mother, and yeah. your father, right. another relative. Yeah. 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 Let me say that, that Ellen's book is going to break open an enormous conversation in our country. She's gonna sell a million copies of this goddamn book. You know, she's already sold eighty thousand in the first week. And so, and so, there has to be there has to be a follow up. There has to be. So, there's some big things. Number one, we need to change the healthcare system in America. And there's an organization in New York called the Campaign for New York Health. Google Google it. New York, the Campaign for New York Health. Google it, and become involved some way or another locally in order to contribute to support that conversation. Secondly, we're in the process of putting together a campaign that's gonna be anchored by Senator Bob Casey to establish the Smithsonian Museum Institute for Disability in Washington, DC. The last major minority group in the country to have a major institute, a museum in the country. And that process is gonna take, I don't know, 15, 20 years, we're gonna to have to raise God knows how many billions of dollars to make something like that, but it's going to form a conversation that's going to unite the entire disabled spectrum, which is a gigantic number of people in our country. Gigantic number of people. We're talking about mental special needs, physical special needs, sensory special needs, drug addiction special needs, social special needs that have to all come together. And the museum is not going to be like a natural history museum with stuffed birds in it. It's going to be an information and communication center in the 22nd and 23rd century. It's going to be a transformational center for community because now you can pick up the phone and visit anywhere and see anything, talk to anybody anytime about anything. I mean, this box, you know, which is just this, this box, you know, when this box first came out on the market, 2008, that was the first one of these that came out. And look, here we are, 2020. Look at where we are. Look at what this box can do. I mean, it's just staggering, the communication and linkages. Now, what it's doing now is alienating people and everybody's walking around. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I hate the damn thing as a result of that. But, but this is just the beginning and there's gonna be a transformation. We're gonna get back to each other at some point past the box. The box is just light and sound and, and, you know, and connecting to your friends with not too much thought. But the tool is there and the museum will be explosive. Wow. So we need, we need to be connected to uh, groups that essentially can move public policy and not necessarily rely upon or trust your elected legislators. They aren't necessarily honest, no matter what they say to you. Better to go to the people for a vote, for a proposition or, a, or a, a plebiscite of some sort, a direct vote for change. Then the process of shifting us is really gonna be a mind 
burner. I mean, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to use your imagination and come alive again in society. We're not right now. We're, we're, we're somehow in neutral, paralyzed, thinking about change, mm -hmm. and then defensive. One quick thing, as we continue the conversation, our bookseller has to leave shortly. So if anyone would like to purchase a copy of The Lost Girls of Willow Brook, please take away our And copy. have this marvelous woman sign your book. <laughs> but I think it is the power of storytelling. I mean, you look at what um, Jane Austen did with the Geraldo's expose did. You know, he told a story and yeah. that made people have an emotional connection. Yeah. And what a novel can do is create that emotional connection what this book, your book of the facts can do is create that, that emotional connection. That's the first step. It's getting people to feel, and then they'll start moving. Yeah, everybody that has read my book is like, I just need to research this more and find out more. And, you know, it's like, they didn't know about it. I said, everyone has read my book has wanted to research Willowbrook more and, and find out more about it. And of course, his. Oh, I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned his book in the in the back, and and the um, other one he co-authored. So I hope that that's where they're going to start. <laughs> Get her book, so she'll sign it for you now.